All right. As promised, we are here. The Newbie's Guide to Processing Raw Files in Darktable. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 140 of Understanding Darktable. In the last episode, which I'm hoping you did not skip over, I explained why when you import a raw file into Darktable, it can look just like the in-camera JPEG in the light table view. But when you come into the darkroom view, suddenly it looks different. Now, I had these three images of this wallaby that I shot not far from home, a couple of, oh, about a week ago. And this second frame was probably the sharpest of the three. So we'll muck around with this. So as you can see, this looks a little bit different to the in-camera JPEG. That's the in-camera JPEG. This is the raw data. And as I explained, all of these steps here cannot be removed. They are done in every other piece of image editing software you've ever used that you know, turns a raw file into an image. It's just that most other pieces of software don't show you. So we've got this image and the only thing that not part of the defaults here is exposure and filmic RGB. And as I explained in the last video, those two entries in the history stack are there because of a preference which I have set. Okay, so if we go into preferences and to the processing tab, you will see here auto apply pixel workflow defaults. And I have scene referred filmic as my choice. Now, in Darktable, if you choose anything which is not the default, you will see a white dot. I love that. I wish other software did that to say this setting has been changed away from the default setting. So the default is filmic. And what it means is that filmic and sigmoid and base curve, which we'll ignore because it's the black sheep of the family, are all tone mapping modules. So they're there to help you nail your white point without clipping highlights and to nail your black point without crushing your shadows too much. Of course, that's up to you and your own personal aesthetic uh, and to map all of the tones in between. So by default, Darktable gives you filmic as your basic pixel workflow default. If we were to choose Sigmoid, and I was to now reset this history stack, you will see that instead of exposure and filmic, it's now exposure and sigmoid. And if we were to look at the active modules, which is the group signified with the power button type icon, this reads from the first state being at the bottom of a stack, our raw black and white point, white balance, highlight, reconstruction, demosaic, yada, 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 yada. And there is sigmoid just after color calibration. So depending on which of these, you know, you choose to use, if you went with legacy, that's where base curve would come into it. So if we go with legacy and we reset the history stack again, we will see base curve is there now. And base curve looks like a tone curve. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of base curve. Let's not get into why. Uh, let's just be content with the idea that the default setting here is filmic. But if you don't want any tone mapping at all, you can set this to none. And then if we were to reset our history state again, you'll see that there is now no tone mapping module applied. Now that doesn't mean you can't go and apply filmic or sigmoid or base curve later on in your own you know, time. You can certainly do that. So which you choose, 
totally up to you. I will set it back to filmic because that's just the way I roll. All right, so we have this image. I'll reset this. That will then apply filmic again. All right, so processing a raw file in Darktable for a new user. Where do you start? First thing, if you need to do any type of rotation, it is simply right click and drag to draw a line on your image. And you can see that there is a positive degrees and negative degrees number right next to your cursor, which will indicate how much you are going to rotate that image by. Release your mouse and Darktable will automatically set whatever angle you had that red line at to zero degrees. So it's rotating by that amount. If you want to reset that, you will notice that in your active group, there is now rotate and perspective. You can simply turn that off to set it back to where it was, or you could have hit the reset button. Either will do the same thing. The great thing about that particular tool of being able to right click and drag to set rotation is that it also works in the vertical domain. So you'll notice if you draw something close to a vertical line, you've got negative values and positive values there. It's really good when you've shot architecture and you want to get the verticals of a building straight because you can simply go, okay, well that vertical is leaning a little bit to the left, so I'll draw a line like that down the side of a building, let go and wham, it just corrects it for you. So it rotates by that fixed amount. So that is how to rotate an image if you need to do that. If you need to crop, you will find that in the base group. Oh, I should have talked about the, the different groups. So here above the set of modules, I've got a base group, a color group, a corrections group, and an effects group. But that will all depend on which of these module uh, presets you decide to work with from this hamburger menu on the right. Now I'm using workflow scene referred. You can use any of those that you want to use. And as you can see, you can create your own module groups if you are not happy with any of the half dozen that belong here. To do that, you go to manage presets, and that's a topic for a whole other video. In fact, it's a topic of a previous video, so definitely search that one out um, because I've already covered that. Okay, so if you wanted to crop, you would come into the crop module. Again, a little bit of a trap for young players. Let's say you wanted a 16 by 9 format. We can crop from any corner, we can crop from the sides, crop from the corner, crop from the other corners, crop from the sides, crop from the top or bottom. However you want to do it, it's fairly self-explanatory. You can drag the bounding frame around until you've got the framing that you want. Let's say I want my wallaby to sit over there on the left hand, you know, vertical third. Uh, I can do that. And you notice as you're dragging around, you've also got this numeric uh, indicator in the middle to let you know the cropped size of the image. So my raw files are 24 megapixels, so they're roughly 6,000 by 4,000 pixels. Because I've cropped in, I'm now at 5,299 by 2,981. Obviously, those numbers will change if you choose a different aspect ratio. Now, there's a whole bunch of aspect ratios in here by default. You can edit and add other aspect ratios. But again, that's a topic from a previous video. I think it was probably the video. Oh, wow. It may have been a video on the crop module. I honestly don't remember. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sure someone can sing out in the comments. Someone who's been following the channel will remember what you had to do if you wanted to add new crop ratios to this list. 
So let's suppose that we wanted to do a 5 by 7. So there's our 5 by 7 crop. And we can see now that the numeric value of the crop has changed uh, only in the vertical, not in the horizontal. But if I was to then change you know, the crop like so, we can see that the size of the cropped image is changing like so. So we could do something like that. Now you're wondering, how do I commit to this crop? Because if I double click, nothing happens. No, the trick is to simply close the module and that will commit the crop. And it's now another state in your history stack. Okay, so we've rotated, we've cropped. We probably now want to start looking at things like color treatment, white balance, saturation, levels, curves, all that sort of stuff. Most of that you will find in the colors group. Color calibration is a bit of an interesting module because if you look at all Darktable modules, which you can do by simply clicking whichever of these you currently have selected, a second time and it will then give you every module in Darktable in one big list. And you will notice that there is a white balance module, but there is also color calibration which does something very similar to white balance. And that brings us to a bit of a discussion about the white balance module and the color calibration module. In white balance, you have set white balance to as shot. So if you have shot raw, uh, you can choose the white balance setting that you had in camera. Or you can choose select from area. That will put this white bounding box across the majority of your image and Darktable will do its best to interpret the white balance for you or you can go with user modified, which will allow you to adjust the temperature and the tint manually. Then we've got D65, which refers to the camera's reference point. And I've just noticed there's now a new option, which is set white balance to as shot and later correct to camera reference point. In most cases, it should be D65. That's actually a new thing that I've got to have a look into because I'd not seen that before. But essentially what this setting is doing, the D65 setting, is saying leave the white balancing for the color calibration module, which comes later in the pixel pipe. Now, the benefit to leaving white balance to the color calibration module is that in Darktable, you can only have one instance of the white balance module. But the color calibration module, you can have multiple instances of. So if you have an image where you have different color temperature light sources within the one composition, you can actually process different parts of that composition with two separate color calibration modules so that you can work with each color temperature, you know, area within the composition separately, which is a really nice feature. Prior to the introduction of the color calibration module, we never had that ability. We were just stuck with the white balance module. So I tend to leave this on D65 for 99% of my shots every now and again. And I mean, like it is a really rare occurrence. I will come across an image where the color calibration module just doesn't quite get it right. And I will quite often come back to either as shot or let the, you know, let dark table detect the white balance from the entire image. And sometimes that's just a better approach. But 99% of the time, the color calibration module does a great job. So if we look at the color calibration module, it looks like this. Now, one thing that is different about the color calibration module to the white balance module in, say, Adobe Lightroom is the color slider is a color slider, but there's no tint slider by default. There are so many options here which I have covered in a previous video. 
I highly recommend that you go and watch that video. But once again, you have this eyedropper here, which will allow you to take a white balance reading from the image. And most of the time that will do a pretty good job as it has in this instance. All right, if we assume that we are happy with that as a white balance, we then might want to start looking at contrast. Or maybe we want to look at color. Or maybe we want to look at both. The Color Balance RGB module. Now this can be quite intimidating to a new user. Essentially in the master panel here, we've got a hue shift. So if you decide you want to do something absolutely crazy with the hue, you can do that. If you want to reset any of these sliders, right click, press zero, press enter, and that's back to zero. You could always hit the reset button on the module, but that will reset the entire module, like every slider. If, you, if it's just one slider you want to reset, just right click on it, press zero, hit enter, you're good. Vibrance does like Vibrance does. Again, set that back to zero. Contrast will add contrast or reduce contrast. Again, next up we've got linear chroma grading, and you can do it globally, or you can do it by shadows, midtones, and highlights individually. Then you've got saturation, which again you can do globally, or you might just want to do midtones only and leave the highlights and the shadows untouched. Entirely up to you. And then finally, perceptual brilliance grading. This is a little bit like a lightness control. Again, you can do it globally, or you might just want to lift the midtones without adjusting the highlights. And maybe you wanted to lift the shadows as well, but again, leaving the highlights where they were. So, lots of ways you can play with tone and color within the Color Balance RGB module. The Four Ways tab and the Masks tab is some pretty advanced stuff. If you feel like you're ready for it, I highly recommend you go and find the video that I did on Color Balance RGB. If I remember, I'll link to it up there. And in that video, I do cover the Four Ways and Masks tabs. But most of the time, the master tab will get you to where you want to go. There are other options for dealing with tones, and probably one of the better ones is the Tone Equalizer. Again, I've done a previous video on this module. And again, if I think about it, I'll link to it up here. Uh, but this allows you to select particular ranges of tone and remap them according to what you want to do. And again, this is quite a complex module, particularly when you start looking at the advanced tab and the masking tab. Again, I'm not going to try and, you know, summarize what I covered in that previous video because we'll be here all night. But the tone equalizer is good if you really want to get into the nitty gritty of working with what's in various stages of shadow, mid-tone and highlight within your image. If you do need to do any denoising of your image, jump over to the correct tab and you will find Denoise Profiled. This does a fantastic job. Darktable has a database of a lot of cameras. I won't say every camera ever released, but it has a lot of cameras with noise profiles for every ISO setting from each of those cameras. So if I was to turn this module on, I'll just hit the reset. This will automatically look up a Sony a7 III at 200 ISO, and it has applied denoise settings, not that an A7 III at 200 ISO needs denoising, let me tell you, it's a phenomenal camera. But depending on what you know camera you've used and what ISO you've shot at, the denoise profiled will dial in exact settings for that camera at that ISO. It does an amazing job, and again, 
Yes, I've done a video on this module in the past. Search my channel, or if I remember, it'll be up there. Um, yeah, you can do some amazing things with the denoising. Uh, for those of you who like lens correction, there is a dedicated lens correction module, and this uses a third-party database called LensFun, at least on Linux. I assume it uses the same database on Mac and PC. And again, we could either turn the module on or we could just hit the reset button and that will read the metadata for the lens that this image was shot with and apply known corrections for that focal length on that particular lens. Obviously, if it's a prime lens, then there's only one focal length, but if it's a zoom lens, then it will have corrections for all of the focal range of a zoom lens. If you are shooting long exposures and you end up with hot pixels, there is a dedicated hot pixels module and it does like it says on the tin. It will identify hot pixels in your image and you can adjust the threshold and the strength as you see fit. If you're worried about chromatic aberrations or you actually have chromatic aberrations in some of your images, there is a dedicated chromatic aberrations module. Uh, again, you can just switch it on and if you need to dial in your own settings, go right ahead. But most of the time it'll do a pretty good job straight out of the box. Now, sometimes you will have dirt on images and I just went looking for an image with some dirt on it and I couldn't find one. So I just grabbed this image of the full moon rising beside a power station in my local neighborhood. And the retouch module is the module you will use for cleaning up dirt and things in images that you don't want. Again, I've done a fairly dedicated video on this particular module. I highly recommend you search that out. It defaults to a healing mode, but you also have a cloning mode and autofill and yeah, a bunch of other things. So we'll grab a circle and We'll just make it a little bit bigger and shift key will allow me to alter the fall off between those pixels which are being cloned and those which are being blended with original pixels. So we'll just bring that in a little bit and we'll come down a little bit and we'll just go and try and drag to an area of similar tonality and do that and Hey presto, the moon is gone. We're all living in darkness. Okay, there's a lot more to the retouch module. I highly recommend that you search out the video I've done on that. If you need to sharpen your image, then there is the sharpen module, but there is also diffuse and sharpen, uh, which is another module. Diffuse or sharpen is very, CPU intensive. Uh, there are some really good presets stored in this module and I highly recommend that you give them a go, but just be aware that that module really does tax your system. Okie dokie. I think that will do it for now. There's probably a thousand things that I could cover that a newbie who's processing raw files wants to know. But hopefully I've covered the things that are highest on the list of priorities. If you've got questions, please sing out down below in the comments. I will do my best to answer them. Uh, and yeah, we'll leave it at that. All right, guys, all the best to those of you who are new users to Darktable. Welcome aboard. Good on you for taking the plunge uh, and um, getting out of subscription hell. And uh, I will catch you in the next one.